So in this little video, we're going to talk about heat pumps in particular. So this sits within week two session, but we spun it out into its own little video so we can talk a little bit more about the heat pumps uh, if you're less familiar with the technology and explain it in a little more detail. What is a heat pump? You can get three different types of heat pumps. Um, in the, uh, typically in this part of the world, you can get a ground source heat pump, which um, basically it consumes electricity. Is its main fuel source is, source is actually electricity. I see heat pumps as making electricity more efficient because for every unit of electricity that's consumed by the compressor within the heat pump, it, it is pumping three units of heat from its source into your building. So that when you're using it in a heating mode, um, it's it's a uh, um, so that, that's that's kind of the, the the how this building is really I don't see it as a source of energy, an alternative fuel source. Its fuel source is, is electricity, it makes electricity more efficient. Um, different types of underground, you can have it in a garden in a horizontal manner like this, or if the building was being piled, you can put the pipes down in through the pile, so in a horizontal man or vertical manner uh, as well. Uh, air source heat pumps sit up up on top of a building or next to a building and they look like this. They may also look like this. Uh, however, don't be mistaken them with a, a cooling system, a split unit where if you have a one room that's um, experiencing heating problem or overheating, uh, often they retrofit uh, what they would typically call a split unit uh, as an artificial air conditioning system. Um, and so it's very common to see these type of buildings uh, for, for providing cooling. And it's the same technology, just works in reverse. Uh, during the summer, you, you work it as a uh, providing cooling and during this winter you uh, work it to provide heating unfortunately the optimum design for one is not the same as the other so um uh, you, you don't get a magic return of a device that does both brilliantly. Uh, if you wanted it to do mainly cooling, then the optimum design for cooling is one design. And if you wanted it to do mainly heating, then the optimum design for, for that system is slightly different. Um, so uh, if, if we're looking at the UK domestic market, then uh, currently there's, there's little or no need for artificial cooling. And so these devices um, will operate as a heating device to replace a boiler. Air source heat pumps, I say, located with air across them, and you're pumping heat from the air into your building uh, to, to whatever heat sources are in your building, whether it's underfloor, like shown here, or radiators, or whatever it is around your building. You can also get water source. If, you're, if you happen to be located near the water, it's quite common to uh, have a water source heat pump. Water is quite a good uh, medium for using in a heat pump. Um, and the Sydney Opera House, because it happens to be adjacent to the water, uh, actually has an um, extensive system of water source heat pumps associated with, with it. The efficiency of a heat pump is measured of something called the COP, the coefficient of performance. And when you buy a piece of kit or when you're getting sold a piece of kit, they, they'll tell you this air source heat pump will have a COP of 3.5, which means for every unit of energy, electric, electrical energy, that compressor will uh, consume off the grid. It'll deliver 3.5 units of energy of heat through from the garden. Um, so electricity is high grade energy, heat is low grade energy. So there's an ent entropy change we'll talk about a little bit later, um, but uh, you are getting more um, uh, uh, more energy than if you were just putting that electricity straight into a bar heater, an electrical resistor, and turning it directly into energy. You'd only get a one to one ratio. By using a heat pump, you're getting a one to three ratio. So you're getting more, much more heat for the energy that you're using. I use the analogy of miles per gallon on a car, however, because there's lots of little things you can do to not make that efficiency actually um, um, true. So you know that if you buy a car and it says 50 miles per gallon is its efficiency rate, and you drive it around for a while and you figure out how to, after a year, you figure out how to turn on the dial and it says 35 miles per gallon. I said, why is it 35? I should be 50. I bought a 50. And you realize then when you do some research that it depends how you drive, how, how hard you are, heavier you are on the brake, um, whether you're doing city driving or country driving, how well you maintain your car. There's lots of little factors that influence that miles per gallon. Um, and if you ever actually try to get the miles per gallon, I think there was even a Top Gear episode uh, where they tried to drive from London to Edinburgh and back um, on, a, uh, on a, um, an Audi that was... Um, uh, supposed to be at, at its peak and they went through all the processes that they had to go through in order to uh, uh, drive in the right manner and uh, and operate the car in the right manner in order to uh, make it back there on that journey on a full fuel tank of fuel so um, there's lots of things there likewise with an air, air source heat pump it's a similar analogy there's lots of little things that could make that actual performance not operate as good one of my big um, 
gripes on this industry at the moment is that they're not very transparent about that they don't like to talk about that and i think they should be more transparent and it should be more it should be as easy to to look at the actual operating seasonal coefficient of performance uh, of your building as it is to see the actual performance of your car um, because uh, then you you'll know um, you know how the building is actually run and whether you're running that that system uh, easily what what t um, can influence the efficiency of the heat pump one is its optimum location so uh, whether it's uh, where the heat comes into the system in your garden or in the air it likes to have a lot of flow across that that heat emitter so it, uh, the air uh, in exposed up on a roof lots of air going through it would be ideal if you put it down on the ground and you put a hoarding around it it's not ideal because it's the, it limits the air going flowing across it the efficiencies will will change as a result so actually that uh, that can cause that can cause a bit of a problem just because of the airflow across it. Uh, likewise, the garden, if you put it in the wrong location, the right wrong type of soil, you don't get heat flow across this uh, into it, it's gonna have a, a, an impact. So there's an optimum location for where you actually put the system in the first place. It, it, it's sometimes because you're pumping heat out of the air outside and you're pumping heat out of the garden um, you, it can actually get down to freezing level um, a lot of these kits kit is tested in places like Germany where they have much drier winters we have very humid winters and so the risk of freezing over is higher here and what happens if you freeze over you have to now reverse the system and defrost it which again uses up more energy and your C SCOP will will, um, will be worse as a result so it could be that in a, in a damp environment um you can you can even freeze your garden or freeze the air um it's this is one of the reasons why ground source heat pumps is actually more efficient than air source heat pumps is because it's more irregular and less likely to freeze uh in in that location and the temperature is more constant it's not as varied as it is with air uh, there's also the possibility of a scalding cycle so if you're replacing uh, your boiler with a heat pump you expect your boiler to do both space heating with radiators but also water heating well, if you ask your um, heat pump to do water heating, it now needs to go up to 65 degrees and it, it doesn't really like going up to high temperatures. The lower you can keep that temperature, the more efficient your heat pump is. Um, and so if, if you do put it on the hot water, uh, one hour a day, it has to go up to 65 degrees and, and basically burn off all your legionnaires uh, spurs and then it can come back down to its efficient level again so by adding that requirement of having it as for hot water as well as space heating can actually make the whole efficiency less as well perhaps it's worth considering a solar thermal system with a tank so that you can get the solar energy to heat your hot water instead now you're paying for an extra system you're paying for solar thermal and you're paying for heat pump to replace a boiler so i'd like for like efficiency might be less feasible but maybe overall it's better performing and uh, i i'm a I, I think i'm a fan of uh, solar thermal especially if they're installed correctly as well it's a good match for underfloor heating so that's why uh ground source heat pump or air source heat pump the component in the building itself is is well matched to underfloor heating why because underfloor heating is so big it doesn't have to be as hot to deliver comfort it can only be up to maybe uh, 40 degrees uh, it, a radiator on your wall at home with a typical boiler needs to go up to maybe 70 degrees uh, to keep that small radiator to pile in enough uh, heat uh, into the space um, if you don't use underfloor heating with a ground source heat pump, even then they have to double the size of the radiator. So you're going to have much more radiators in a in a building with heat with a, with a ground source heat pump than you will with a boiler because they they still will operate at maybe 50 degrees um, and then go to the scalding cycle one hour a week for maybe hot water. Um, but if you can go to underfloor heating and it's bigger size, it's better match. And underfloor heating is a good match for comfort for humans as well. We love warm feet and a cool head. Uh, that's why trying to force heat down on top of us with a radiant heat or something like that just doesn't match the way our bodies work. Our bodies love cool, warm feet, cool heads. And so underfloor heating is just a really nice match uh, as well as being energy efficient in delivering that. So that's why it's a good match for, for heat pumps. It's also a good match with a thermal store. So um, because you're using electricity and you can get cheaper rates in electricity at nighttime, you could possibly charge a thermal store over the nighttime with cheaper electricity and then during the day use that store. Now that store might be just heavy thermal mass in your building itself, the actual walls and the, and the structure of your building has a heavy thermal mass. Or it might be a dedicated system like a mechanical drum with a phase change material. You charge that drum up at nighttime and then that drum is delivering your, your heat during the day to the, to the required amount. 
put in something like a weather compensation where you're trying to predict, do I need a full charge or can I get away with half a charge for the next day um, so that you're not using less electricity at nighttime as well. There's a little complication that can happen in there on optimizing uh, your system for uh, when you're using a thermal store. So they're, that, that, they're, all of those things affect efficiencies, but I do think they're going to be a key technology in, in um, replacing boilers in particular. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about the scientific principles behind uh, why a heat pump work. They're a little counterintuitive. Uh, if you're, um, if you're, if you just want to see the the video towards the end of uh, uh, the little graph of feedback from you uh, at, um, uh, on on feedback, uh, in a, skip a, skip a couple of minutes because I'm going to spend some time when this little fly gets away from me. Sorry, I'm a little bit distracted. Uh, I'm going to spend two minutes um, answering this question. Um, the technology, how it works. Imagine for a second that you were just circulating in it's the middle of winter and you were circulating between uh, the garden here, which about a meter below your garden, it's a constant 12 degrees, 12 degrees. And let's say your building was uh, 15 degrees, right? So you wanted to turn on the heating, it's cold, you turn on the heating. You just think that circulating a, a liquid between those you you intuitively you're thinking well i'm just going to warm my garden it's just they're all going to even out at around uh 14 13 or 14 degrees if i circulate it it doesn't make sense that you can pump heat from a colder source into a warmer source but you can because you're using something called a vapor compression cycle you're using a refrigerant and uh, and you're changing that refrigerant's um, boiling temperature or evaporation temperature by changing its uh, pressure. So at one pressure, when it's out in your garden, um, uh, it wants to turn from a um, a liquid into a gas. And by turning from a liquid into a gas, uh, it it consumes up a whole lot of latent energy, uh, and so the the it sucks energy into itself, even driving that temperature down below 12 to 8, 6 degrees, 5 degrees, even towards freezing, can drive that temperature, and all that energy gets sucked in as uh, converting that um, liquid to a gas as latent heat. Then that uh, liquid gets brought into to the building and now has all this latent heat in it. How do we get that latent energy out? We turn it from a gas back to a liquid again. If we turn it from a gas back to a liquid again, uh, it releases that energy. Uh, <clears throat> and perhaps it, um, uh, it needs to change its state. So we change its pressure and then its uh, temperature, which it wants to change, changes around. So it's the same technology, very, very common technology. Same technology as in your fridge or in any cooling system that has a refrigerant. And so that's why you can pump from a cold source like a ground into a warm source and the temperature uh, of your garden will go down and the temperature of your building will go up. So that's what's something called a vapor compression cycle. The other thing to get your head around that really makes it um, interesting or makes this whole debate around heat pumps and boilers more understandable is the concept of entropy. Now entropy is a second law of thermodynamics that energy doesn't have just a quantity, it also has a quality. So there's not a kilowatt hour of um, thermal energy, heat energy, a kilowatt hour of chemical energy in the form of a gas that you uh, with the calorific value, and a kilowatt hour of electrical energy and electricity. They all have the same value of energy in terms of how much it is, but they have very different values of entropy. Electricity is high entropy, chemical entropy, a uh, chemical energy is medium, and heat is the is the lowest possible one you can get. Now, if you have a lot of heat energy and you want to convert it. Sorry, if you have a lot of chemical energy, gas, in other words, and you're going to burn it, you can almost get 100% of that gas to energy to convert down the to heat energy. So going from gas down to heat in a boiler, you can get up to 95% efficiency. 95% of the energy in that chemical bonds can go uh, as heat. Whereas if you take that gas and you go to a power station where you're generating electricity, because of entropy, because you're now going up to a high-grade energy electricity, um, the law of entropy means that you can only really go for a, a third of the energy up up the up the scale. So for every energy, uh, for turning the chemical bonds into electricity, a third of that energy will go uh, as electricity, and two thirds will dissipate as heat. So if you ever see a uh, a, um, a, a power station, you see these massive cooling towers because it needs to dissipate all this heat somewhere from, that's coming from the chemical energy. It has nothing to do with it. So that's why electricity costs three times the amount of gas costs because you ha are sending two units of energy up a cooling tower for every unit you're sending down a cable from a power station. So 
So if you're using electricity here to deliver heat, it's very inefficient. It's much better actually to, to bring gas to your building and, and boiler um, because of that three to one ratio. That's why a heat pump reverses that again. Three to one is a very important ratio for a heat pump because now it makes it more effective again. It's taking one unit of electricity and it's pumping three units of heat uh, back into your building. So that makes it compatible with gas on a more, a more fundamental level. Um, electricity is three times more expensive than gas, but you're getting three times the amount of energy through from your garden. So um, that's why they're very careful about saying the COP is three uh, and they don't really, they're not very transparent about telling you what the seasonal COP is for the whole system and how it's installed and whether it's concrete in the building that you're setting your underfloor heating into or timber, which might slow up the, the movement of heat through there. Um, they don't tell you all of this because if it turned out that uh, your COP was only 2 or 2.5, then the, the case against uh, boilers becomes much less efficient. So that's why understanding entropy really makes uh, the comparison of a heat pump to a boiler much more understandable. Again, all the feedback then from uh, from you uh, on the, the participants were uh, on the crowdsource document. And this is what you said. You, uh, that basically, people agreed, vast majority of people agreed heat pump are key technology and that they will be in most buildings from, uh, from 2030 and in all buildings from 2050, pretty much in the UK anyway, where we're a heating environment. Uh, even those who, you know, tiny number of people think they're a flawed technology. Um, and you can see um, as, as, as the more use there, the more people there are. Some feedback as well. Um, the, the, it's right, just like with boilers, there's a huge industry out there of boiler maintenance people, and we can't really convince them at the moment to also take on heat pumps. So we either have to convince them to train uh, to be maintenance of heat pumps, or we have to build a whole army of heat pump maintenance engineers there's the, it, that don't exist at the moment. So it's it's not just a supply technical issue, it's, it's a maintainability issue as well. Um, Again, underfloor heating is becoming more popular, they're saying, and there is a massive gas gap between what they tell us they're going to do and what the, they actually do. I wouldn't call them a massive gap, but enough of a gap that, that would make you worried. And the fact that they're not being transparent about it is a big flaw. So if you do work for a heat pump company, please, please, please be more transparent about the operational energy of your system. Provide a little... Uh, um, a plug in for your smart meter or whatever it is so that someone can see just like you can on miles per gallon you can actually see what your actual seasonal cop is and it might say it's two and you, then you can give them advice as to what they can do to install that properly or at least will the the the, the um contractors or there is a quality scheme for contractors so if you're with a certified quality provider they're supposed to install everything correctly but even then um uh, it's uh, it, it, you can get uh, difference and variations in performance. So yes, a key technology. I've just realized that written at the top of this document is MVHRs because I copied and pasted. It should be heat pump. Sorry about that. Um, but yes, a, a vital technology needs more mature uh, industry, more mature, uh, supply chain, more maintenance.